morning of December 21st, 2015, firefighters were called to the scene of a house fire in the small village of Rupersville in Switzerland. Rupersville is a quiet little town of around 5,000 people, the kind of place where the Wikipedia page has just one paragraph about it. Rupersville wasn't known for much, but it was about to get a reputation that it may never be able to shake. The firefighters went about their work, dousing the flames and checking the ruins for any sign of survivors. The call about the fire hadn't come from anyone inside of the house, and there had been no screams or cries from help from inside while the structure had been burning, so it was possible that the house was empty. The small family home wasn't abandoned, but obviously fires can happen while nobody is at home and maybe this was a simple case of a wiring issue that led to a fire while the family was away. All thoughts of that being the case vanished when firefighters found the bodies. There were four bodies in the house. At least three of the bodies were bound with cable ties, several had been stabbed, and all four of their throats had been slashed with a sharp knife. The dead were quickly identified as 48-year-old Carla Schauer Freiberghaus, her sons Davin and Dion, and Dion's girlfriend, 21-year-old Simona Foss. The youngest victim, Davin, showed signs of sexual assault with a foreign object, and all of them had been dead well before the fire ever started. The only known survivor of the incident was Carla's partner, who had left for work before the house had ever caught fire. It's logical in these situations to suspect the sole survivor of having something to do with the crime. After all, there's a reason many true crime podcasts sell merch with the slogan, The Husband Did It. But in this case, authorities quickly figured out that someone else had been in that house. While it wasn't hard to find the partner's DNA and fingerprints at the scene, he did live there after all. What did stand out to investigators were that fingerprints and DNA were found at the scene that didn't belong to anyone in the house. Those fingerprints and DNA left behind were from an unknown male. The local authorities offered a staggering reward of 100,000 Swiss francs for information about the murders, the largest reward in Swiss criminal history. And with the vicious nature of the crime, along with the huge reward for his capture, it was only a matter of time before he was given a name by the media. And that name would be the Beast of Rupersville. It's a little tricky to work out the timeline of the five month long investigation. Most of the sources are in German, but thanks to translation software, I have been able to piece together two of the most important factors in identifying the Beast of Rupersville, those being Google and dogs. It was pretty clear from the crime scene that someone had entered the home, tied up the victims, sexually assaulted at least one of them, killed them, and then set the house on fire. There had been no one close to the family who made a good suspect, so the Beast had to be a stranger. But who lets a stranger into their house on a random morning? Whoever the beast was, he had to have done at least a little bit of homework. This now leads to my first of the two important factors in this case, Google. Swiss authorities approached Google's parent company, Alphabet, and asked for their IP addresses of anyone who had been Googling the family in the days leading up to the murders. For those who don't know, your IP address is a unique string of numbers assigned to each device that connects you to the internet. It tells online servers, such as the ones at Google, where to send the information your device has requested. Every time you Google something, Google logs the IP address of your phone, tablet, or computer so it knows where to send your search results. Some IP addresses are tied to physical locations, however, like the internet connection in your house or at an office. Others are connected to only mobile devices, but there are ways to track those as well. As you can imagine, there probably wouldn't be many people in Rupersville randomly googling murder victims before they were killed. And the information from Alphabet led authorities to a 33-year-old named Thomas Nick, who lived with his mother near the scene of the crime. Nick had no criminal record, and his primary leisure activity was training young athletes and working as a coordinator for the local youth football organization. 
He was well liked and he didn't seem to know Carla or her children. But because Googling someone isn't proof of murder, that's where the dogs came in. If you'd asked Nick's neighbors about him, most of them would offer up a handful of details with one thing in common. He had two pet huskies. Now, it is widely understood that huskies are very high energy dogs. If they don't get enough exercise and stimulation, they'll tear up your home. And you'll also hear the never ending howling that they are famous for. As a result of this, Thomas Nick was well known around the neighborhood for taking his dogs on long walks at the same time every day. And in a small town, it's hard to miss a man walking two large dogs past your house each morning. And when police pulled Nick's phone records, they found that someone carrying his phone left his house every day around the same time, wandered around the neighborhood, and then went home. Except on the morning of the murders, when the dogs apparently didn't feel like going anywhere that day. Now, granted, this isn't any kind of rock-solid proof, but it was enough to allow authorities to focus the investigation on Thomas Nick. And in what I feel was a genius move, police set up a drunk driving checkpoint in town, stopping every driver and having them blow into a breathalyzer. Once Nick was done puffing and proving that his blood alcohol level was below the legal limit, the police switched out the tube that had been in his mouth and sent it away for DNA analysis. And the DNA in Nick's saliva matched with the samples found at the crime scene. Thomas Nick was arrested on May 12, 2016 in the nearby city of Aro. When police searched his home, they found the cable ties, duct tape, and an old Luger-style pistol and handcuffs that he made himself out of rope. Nick quickly confessed to the Swiss authorities. He said he'd entered the home after Carla's partner left, claiming to be a school psychologist from Davin's school. Once inside, he threatened Davin and forced Carla to tie up Dion and Simona. He then quickly demanded money and held Davin, Dion, and Simona all hostage while Carla went to an ATM and then to a bank to withdraw a total of 1,000 euros or about $11,000. After Carla came back with the money, Nick tied her up, sexually assaulted Davin with a toy that he'd brought with him, and then bound the younger boy's wrist, gagged him, and then stabbed the victims before cutting all four of their throats. He then set the house on fire and left. Now, this seems like a senselessly overly graphic and overly violent crime for $11,000. But the only motive Nick offered during his trial was one single word. He was a pedophile. Authorities believe that he chose Carla and her family only because they had a 13-year-old son. Police also found evidence that Nick had been spying on two other families in northern Switzerland, apparently planning to repeat his offense. Thomas Nick was convicted in March of 2018 of charges including murder, extortion, hostage taking, sexual assault, and arson. He was sentenced to life in prison, although there is some possibility that he could be paroled if extremely strict conditions are met. At his conviction, the lead judge said that Nick acted in cold blood with a primitive manner, without pity nor empathy. As of this video, the Beast of Rupersville remains in prison in Switzerland. And this case is honestly an important lesson, that even though someone may appear friendly and even have a good standing in the community, you never know what kind of evil a person is truly capable of. As you know, my videos are always about the disturbing and shocking. I do a lot of research on topics like today's, and from time to time, I really just need to go outside to not go insane on the cruelty that I'm digging into, or the hours that I am spending in front of my computer. That's why I'm happy to now have a companion that reminds me to take time for myself every now and then, and also to relax if it ever gets too nerve-wracking. My watch and jewelry from Holzkern, the brand for accessories with a natural and unique touch. 
When Holzkern reached out to me, I was sold almost immediately as their style is exactly what I like in jewelry, especially watches. I know most people only wear smart watches and I myself am guilty of that, but there is something timeless about a mechanical watch that surely will make you stand out in the crowd. I have been wearing Holzkern's products for several weeks now and I have actually been asked by complete strangers where I got my watch from. Their clue is to use natural materials in every product, no matter if it is wood or stone, which makes each piece a unique one due to grain or marbling, such as my Houston, a beautiful marble wood watch that is unlike any watch that I have ever owned. And if watches aren't your thing, then don't worry, as Holzkern also carries necklaces, such as this zigzag necklace with a glorious and sleek marble finish. Holzkern also has sunglasses for everyone. The pair you are currently seeing is the properly titled Badass One that comes in a leadwood and antique silver look. Another thing that I have to mention and that I noticed almost immediately was the level of comfort of the jewelry. The watches don't pitch my skin and the necklaces don't catch in my hair and the sunglasses can be worn all day with none of that annoying pain on your ears. Seriously, Holzkern is some of the most comfortable jewelry that I have ever worn. With free shipping anywhere in the United States and most European countries within two to five days and all items coming with a 24 month warranty, there's nothing to worry about when you're ordering. From watches to sunglasses to handbags and earrings or necklaces, you are sure to find something that helps express the uniqueness of you. And more than 1 million customers also speak a clear language regarding the designs and quality. So what are you waiting for? Click the link in the description below and head on over to Holzkern. And don't forget to use code CADABER15 for 15% off your purchase. That's code CADABER15 for 15% off your purchase. Thanks to Holzkern for sponsoring today's video. In the early 1960s, the small village of Yerba Buena in the Mexican state of San Luis Fatosi was little more than a gap in the road. It had only about 50 residents, most of whom had little or no education. The people of Yerba Buena made their living from farming at the foot of the Sierra Madre Mountains. It was the kind of place that no one who didn't live there was likely to care about or even be aware that it exists. And that's probably why the Hernandez brothers decided to start a cult there. Santos and Cayetano Hernandez were petty con artists looking to get rich. It's not clear from the records whether they grew up in Yerba Buena or chose the town for some other reason. But in late 1962 or early 1963, they rolled into town and proclaimed themselves to be the prophets and the high priest of what they called the exiled Inca gods. They used sleight of hand tricks to convince the locals that they had magic powers, performed rituals in the mountain caves, and told the villagers that in exchange for worship and tributes, the gods would grant them treasure that were hidden elsewhere in the mountains. Unfortunately, the tributes that were requested by the Hernandez brothers were mostly in the form of money, worship, or let's just say services of the physical variety. The Hernandez brothers were also big on group parties of the physical kind if you catch my drift, especially those where everyone was doing various types of drugs. And while ordinarily I wouldn't judge what consenting adults would get up to in their spare time, the problem that I have with the brothers is that they took young girls, as young as 14, from their parents to, and I quote, teach them about love. And for added measure, they also told all of the locals that the gods were on their way to reclaim their ancient kingdom, and they would punish all non-believers. In case this situation hasn't raised enough red flags for everyone listening, let me add this. If anyone ever tells you that the gods will deliver you treasure if you let them traffic your kids, and if you don't then you will be destroyed in an apocalypse, then that person is lying. And also I need to say this just because it 
annoys me about the brother's stupidity. The Inca Empire actually stretched across the western coast of South America. No part of it was ever in Mexico. It just baffles me because if you wanted to start a cult based on your own pre-Columbian culture in Mexico, you may want to base it on the Aztecs or maybe the Maya in the southeastern part of the country. These geniuses hadn't even bothered to research their own scam, but unfortunately it didn't really matter because no one in Yerba Buena was likely to have a history book handy to fact check them. Going back to the story, things continued like this for a while, but eventually the people of Yerba Buena started to notice that shockingly no one had found any treasure in the mountains. No matter how much money they gave to the brothers and no matter what they subjected their kids to. That's the kind of thing that makes your followers very unhappy. So, because the brothers were starting to realize that their scheme was starting to have a spotlight on it, they decided to travel to the city of Monterey to find something that would help them keep this scam going. And what they found was Magdalena Solis. Magdalena was a rough character. She was a teenage sex worker, probably about 16 years old, when she met the brothers. She was born into a poor family in northeastern Mexico around 1947 and had reportedly been doing sex work from a very early age, along with a very lucrative side hustle as a fortune teller and medium. Her older brother, Alazar, was actually acting as her pimp. Magdalena agreed to go back to Yerba Buena with the Hernandez brothers and impersonate one of their gods. And apparently, the brothers actually decided to do some research this time as well, because rather than claiming to be a goddess from an ancient civilization or another continent, Magdalena would present herself as, and please forgive me for butchering this name, Coatlicue, the Aztec goddess who gave birth to the moon, the stars, and the sun god. Magdalena traveled with the Hernandez brothers out to Yerba Buena to play Coatlicue, the Hernandez brothers introduced her to her new followers by making her appear out of a cloud of smoke, and the villagers accepted her as their new goddess. And that is when things took a turn for the worse. Early in her tenure as the so-called goddess of this tiny village in the middle of nowhere, Magdalena experienced what psychologists call theological psychosis. Her mind actually broke with reality and she actually came to believe that she genuinely was the goddess that she claimed to be. She believed that she had the powers of a goddess and that she required specific forms of worship that catered to her sexual proclivities. Once her psychosis took hold, Magdalena effectively took over the cult, leaving the Hernandez brothers more or less powerless. However, they didn't seem to mind as they were still getting most of the same benefits that they had received even before they made their trip to Monterey. Problems arose though when Magdalena began to start putting her own spin on things. She started giving her followers a substance used by the Native American church, that substance being its more popular name being peyote. She also decided to add some colorful extras such as incest, bestiality, and child abuse to their worshiping practices. Around the time that Magdalena took over, two followers of the new faith were having second thoughts about being part of this apparent drugged up sex cult and they privately expressed their desire to leave. Unfortunately, cults aren't exactly a great place to make trustworthy friends and their new fellow devotees told their prophets and their goddess. Magdalena decreed that these two heretics as she so called them, had to be sacrificed to ensure the continued favor of the gods. Magdalena decreed that these two heretics, as she called them, had to be sacrificed to ensure the continued favor of the gods. After her first taste of murder, Magdalena began to quickly escalate. She got bored with the same old activities that they had been doing and devised what she called a blood ritual. The ritual required the cult members to select a human sacrifice, who somehow always turned out to be someone who was having second thoughts about what was going on. The victim would be beaten, burned, cut, and mutilated by all of the remaining members of the cult, and then they would be left to bleed out. Their blood would then be collected into a chalice and mixed with pig or chicken blood, and peyote would also be peppered in just for added measure. 
The mixture would be given to Magdalena to drink first, then passed to her brothers, and finally, the entire congregation. At the end of the ritual, the victim's heart was actually ripped out of their chest. The leaders of the cult proclaimed that the blood rituals gave them supernatural powers, and Magdalena actually believed it. Despite the fact that this cult was literally ripping out hearts, drinking blood, and abusing children, the group's membership began to grow. Six weeks. That's how long the Yerba Buena cult operated without any interference. In that time, at least four people died due to being chosen as the lucky sacrifice. I was only able to find the name of one victim, Selena Salvana, the wife of a farmer in the village. American newspapers would later describe her as a high priestess of the cult, but other sources actually described her as just an ordinary farmer's wife having second thoughts about her involvement. Unfortunately, there will probably never be an exact count of the victims. However, from what I was able to find, 12 people were reported missing by the end of those six weeks. Unfortunately, record keeping isn't that high of a priority in a place where nobody can read. But all of this was about to change. One night in May of 1963, a 14-year-old local boy named Sebastian Guerrero found himself wandering in the mountains near Yerba Buena. While he was exploring the caves, he noticed a light and some noise coming from one cave in particular. Curious, he headed over to investigate. As he approached the mouth of the cave, he was horrified to see a blood ritual in progress. The young boy watched as the cult sacrificed one of their members, then drained and drank the victim's blood. Shocked and traumatized, Sebastian quickly fled the area. As a matter of fact, he ran 25 kilometers, or about 15 and a half miles, to the nearest police station in the town of Villa Gran. He staggered into the station, exhausted from all of the running, and gasped out what he had seen. Unfortunately, Sebastian was in such a deep state of shock that the only description he was able to give the officers was that he'd seen a group of savages drinking human blood. Now, of course, police officers aren't exactly inclined to believe a random teenager who burst into their workplace while babbling about vampires in the mountains. So, Sebastian's story was actually met with more skepticism than any kind of caution. Most of them assumed that Sebastian was either mentally ill or under the influence of something, or even possibly playing a prank. Only one officer, in fact, Luis Martinez, took him seriously enough to do something. Martinez agreed to escort Sebastian home the following day and investigate the place where he'd seen these alleged vampires. As Luis took Sebastian out of the police station and headed back to the direction of the mountains, it would be the last time Sebastian or Martinez were ever seen again. After Martinez failed to return from Yerba Buena, the police in the area got a lot more interested in the talks of these so-called vampires. On May 31st, 1963, a group of officers and soldiers from the Mexican army descended upon Yerba Buena. They found Magdalena and her brother, Elazar, at a farm and arrested both of them. As the raids went on, Santos Hernandez, one of the two who started this entire thing, would actually be killed by police while resisting arrest. His brother, Cayetano, was even more unlucky. A cult member named Jesus Rubio killed him. Some accounts claim that Rubio had actually discovered the scam and demanded that Cayetano cut him in on it. Others claim that Cayetano was trying to assist police to possibly limit his involvement, and due to this, Rubio attacked and killed him. After the dust had settled, about 40 cult members were arrested after most of them barricaded themselves in a cave. A search of that cave would later reveal the remains of six of the sacrificial victims. A search of the farm where the Solis siblings were arrested would eventually turn up the dismembered bodies of Sebastian and Martinez, with Martinez's heart completely gone. With the Hernandez brothers dead, the trial focused on the Solis siblings and the remaining cult members. However, the cult members refused to testify against Magdalena or her brother. 
so the only thing that they could be prosecuted for were the killings of Sebastian and Martinez. Luckily, that was enough to be able to sentence both of the siblings to 50 years in prison. The villagers, in light of their illiteracy and the fact that they had been abused both physically and mentally, still received varying sentences ranging from 18 years to 30 years. Not much is known of Magdalena Solis after her conviction. She would have been eligible for release in 2013 if she had lived that long, but it is not clear if she did. The survivors of Yerba Buena have actually now begun to tell their stories in recent years. But even then, with the aftermath of the events being over 60 years ago, a false goddess still cast a very long and very dark shadow. of August 5th, 1985, a delivery driver pulled his truck up to the door of the Eight Immortals restaurant in Macau, a city spread across the two islands and a peninsula on the southern coast of China. The busy restaurant was a routine stop for the driver. In fact, he'd made a delivery to this place on the previous afternoon, and everything had seemed to be in normal order. However, on this morning, he was greeted by a sign on the door announcing that the restaurant would be closed for three days. The driver was familiar with the family that ran the restaurant. Lin Zhang, the restaurant's founder, had actually started out as a street hawker selling food to passerbys before turning his very small business into a proper restaurant in the 1960s. And now that restaurant was part of the respectable Eight Immortals Hotel and did a solid trade with locals and visitors alike. It also employed many of Zhang's relatives. This was very much a family-run and family-owned business. In fact, the lead chef of the restaurant was Zhang's cousin. The driver found the sign very confusing. No one had told him about the restaurant closing, even temporarily. In fact, he had been there just the day before, and surely they would have canceled all of their deliveries if they had known they would be gone the next day. After all, daily deliveries to Chinese restaurants tend to be things like meats and vegetables, not exactly things that you want to have sitting on your doorstep for several days. The driver decided to make a detour to the Zhang family home to just check on his customers since he knew them so well. But to his surprise, a strange man in his 50s answered the door and told the driver that the Zhang family had made an unexpected trip to the Chinese mainland. He didn't have any other information for the driver, but there was one small detail about this very strange man that stood out to the driver, and that was that the tip of his left index finger was missing. The driver did not know it at the time, but he was the last person to ever see the Zhang family alive. Three days later on August 8th, a swimmer was enjoying the warm summer sun and cool waters of Macau's Black Sand Beach when he made a grim discovery. Eight severed pieces of human limbs washed up on the shore. The police were immediately called, and at first, police actually assumed that the body parts belonged to refugees from mainland China. This was because, due to Macau's booming economy in the 1980s, it wasn't uncommon for poor mainlanders to risk their lives by crossing to Macau illegally in very small boats that were in no way designed to last long at sea. The South China Sea was full of sharks, so plenty of these migrants sadly turned up only in pieces, or not at all. A forensic examination of these body parts was conducted, and two things actually were found of interest. First, the remains had actually been severed with very precise cuts, ruling out a shark attack for obvious reasons. And secondly, the body parts belonged to at least four different people. Whatever had happened here to these people was done by another human. 
Over the next week, three more pieces of human bodies washed up on the beaches of Macau, and authorities began cross-referencing the remains with reports of missing people. Simultaneously, by this point, still no one had heard from the Zhang family, and it has now been over a week, and missing person reports have been filed for the entire family, all 10 people. The oldest missing of the Zhang family was around 70 years old, and the youngest was only seven. Those reports and their similarities to the bodies on the beach brought police to the door of the Eight Immortals restaurant and the mysterious man now operating it. Wang Zihang was a man of many names and many places. He'd been born in mainland China as Chen Shulong, then moved to Hong Kong in the 1970s and started going by his original name and also a third alias, Chen Yuliang before moving away from mainland China, getting married to a landlord's daughter, and then eloping with another woman in Macau. By the time Macau authorities knocked on the door of the Eight Immortals restaurant, Wong had actually been running the place for the past few days, despite having the minor disability, that being that he was missing the tip of his left index finger. And the only reason that I'm pointing out that the tip of his left index finger was missing was that this was a full restaurant. The entire family helped run this, all 10 members. Now, this restaurant was being run by one man and that's it, which obviously caused authorities to look at this entire situation very skeptically. And while it might seem bizarre for a man who wasn't a part of the family to suddenly take over their restaurants in their absence, it actually wasn't such a wild turn of events in the eyes of the neighborhood. Wong was known to hang around with the Zhang family, especially the founder, Lin Zhang, and his wife, Chen. And while the neighbors did find it odd that Wong was suddenly in charge of the entire restaurant, Wong actually had all of the ownership documents in order, and it wasn't like he was a total stranger to the family. To them, weirder things had happened. But then Wong started renting out the Zhang family home and authorities became interested in how he knew the family wouldn't be back anytime soon when their own family members hadn't even heard from them. The police looked into his bank activity and they had found that his assets included documents that belonged to Lin Zhang and a student ID that actually belonged to one of Lin's children. Wong must have realized that the net was closing around him he actually tried to escape to the mainland, but he was captured and arrested in late September of 1986. And at that point, the entire Zhang family had still not been seen for over a year. At this point, with all of the circumstantial evidence and the physical evidence that they had with Wong's bank account, he was charged with the murders of all 10 people and he was convicted on October 2nd, 1986. And if that wasn't bizarre enough, the very next day, an inmate in the prison where Wong was being held attacked him and hurt him, badly enough that he ended up in a hospital. And three days later, Wong made yet another attempt to escape, but he failed. This all led to a few days later when Wong made a full confession. Now, this next part of the story is what happened according to Wong, so take it with a grain of salt. This is, after all, a convicted murderer talking to police from a hospital bed after a fellow inmate tried to kill him. And with his consistent lying to authorities, he's not exactly the most trusting figure. But according to Wong, he's the only one who made it out of the restaurant alive that night. Wong hung around with Lin and his wife largely because they had a very common interest, that being gambling. Macau is actually world famous as a gambling mecca and having nicknames like the Las Vegas of the East. Even today, about 50% of Macau's economy is actually made up of businesses catering to gambling tourists. Actually, since 2007, the casinos in Macau have made more money from gambling than the casinos on the Las Vegas Strip. In other words, Macau is either the best place in the world to have a gambling problem, or it's the worst. And unfortunately, Lin was known to have a severe gambling problem. 
According to Wong, one night in 1984, about a year before the murders, he ended up winning a series of high stakes bets against Lin and his wife. By the end of the night, the couple actually owed Wong around 180,000 patakas, which was about $20,000 then, or roughly $56,000 today. Lin and his family were actually unable to pay that night, so they made a verbal agreement with Hong. They would pay the debt back in its entirety within a year, or they would give Wong ownership of the Eight Immortals restaurant. Wong claimed that the Zhangs not only failed to pay him back within the year, but continued to lose money gambling against him. He told authorities that the Zhangs ended up owing him over 600,000 patakas, or around $75,000. On the night of August 4th, Wong said that nine of the Zhang family members were working in the restaurant after closing. Wong walked in and demanded that the Zhangs pay him 30,000 patakas. This amount seemingly changed every time he told the story, however, ranging from 20,000 to 50,000. But no matter how much he demanded, the money didn't appear, and Lin refused to hand him ownership of the restaurant. So now you've got one guy who is refusing to pay and refusing to honor his deal of the so-called bet, where you have the other guy who hasn't seen a cent of his winnings in well over a year, and this has just continued to build and build, and with the tensions increasing between Wong and Lin, it eventually culminated into what happened that night. What happened next is a bit of a blur, but the words physically aggressive were used by Wong. One thing quickly led to another, and suddenly, before anyone knew it, Wong was holding a broken beer bottle to the neck of Lin's seven-year-old son. With the boy being held hostage, Wong ordered the other members of the family to tie up and to gag each other. They did this, but at some point during the evening, one woman broke free of her bonds and began to scream, so Wong, not thinking and simply reacting, stabbed her in the neck. He then went down the line of victims, killing each one of them by strangulation or with the broken beer bottle. And in the middle of all of this happening, Wong stopped what he was doing when he heard a knock on the door, and it turned out to be one of Lin's sisters. Wong was able to coax her into the restaurant, and as soon as the door closed, Wong pounced on her. Wong spent the next eight hours dismembering the bodies and packaging the remains into black plastic bags. He then dumped the trash bags into dumpsters and threw them into the ocean. After that, he cleaned up, took some money and a key to the safe, and went to Lin's house to spend the night. The next day was when he got a knock on the door from the delivery driver and told him that the family had gone away. After his confession, Wong made two attempts at suicide. He finally accomplished this when he sliced his wrist with a bottle cap and bled out on December 4th, 1986. He left a note behind and a letter to a local newspaper claiming that his death had nothing to do with his crimes. He stated instead that he was only trying to escape his chronic asthma. Take that how you will. At autopsy, authorities took his fingerprints or rather they tried to, since the prints on his fingers had been badly damaged by self-inflicted burns. Despite this, they were able to discover something using his partial prints. Police were able to link him, actually, to a murder completely different from what had happened. It was from the killing of a man in Hong Kong in 1973, over a decade prior obviously meaning that the events that happened on August 4th, 1986 were not Wong's first venture into death. I wasn't able to find the name of Wong's first victim in Hong Kong, but the people who died at the Eight Immortals restaurant was Lin, his wife, all four of his daughters, his son, his cousin, his mother-in-law, and his wife's aunt. The Eight Immortals restaurant murders have had a very strange and somewhat grisly afterlife in pop culture. Because Wong had reopened the restaurant three days after killing ten people in it, an almost urban legend had developed that he had disposed of the bodies by mixing them in with the barbecue pork in the restaurant's famous pork buns. 
I, however, am going to call bullshit on this one. Humans eating other humans is actually pretty rare outside of survival situations, and by all accounts, human bodies are pretty difficult to process into something that looks and tastes like animal meat. More importantly, Wong was trying to hide what he'd done as much as possible so that he could continue making money from the restaurant, and keeping parts of your victims around to serve to your customers probably isn't the best way to do that. However, that didn't stop Hong Kong director Herman Yao from producing a horror movie based on the murders in 1993. The movie was actually marketed in English under the title The Untold Story, but its Chinese counterpart translates to literally human pork bun. The movie made more than $15 million, and yes, the movie does include a scene where detectives are investigating the restaurant, and in true horror movie fashion, while the detectives were searching the restaurant, they were eating the very food that made the restaurant famous, and it's left up to the viewer to decide if the pork buns that the detectives were eating had a special human ingredient. <laughs> 